If you have your Bibles, open to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter number 11. The Gospel of John, chapter number 11. We're still talking about the Gospel is good news. I thank the Lord for the Gospel. It's what makes it, it's the most powerful thing in all the world. It's what makes life uh, actually not just worth living, but uh, able to live. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, This may be the last uh, sermon in this series. We'll see exactly what God's going to do, but uh, grateful for it. If, um, are you in John chapter 11? Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look into your word again. Father, we come with expectation of hearing you. Lord, as we speak of expectations, it's good to know that there are a few things that are certain in our life, and you are one of them. So, Father, just speak to us personally today. May our spirits be open to uh, hear the words that you have to say. May you speak with clarity. You always speak in truth. And, Father, may you speak for change, that we could be uh, transformed by the gospel again every day. And Lord, that includes this day. So, Father, may everything that is said and done, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be your words, be pleasing unto you, and Lord, will bring forth the fruit that you so choose. Father, we just bow before you. We pause before the King of Kings, and we just uh, uh, lay our hearts open before you, people in need before a God who can fill those needs. We thank you for what you have done and with expectation with what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We all live with boundaries in our life, boundaries of expectations, things that we would like to see, and experiences, things that we have already seen. We don't, we, we rarely venture beyond our expectations. We're really pretty comfortable with the experiences that we've seen and what we've known and how we've grown and what we've learned. But usually, we stay within those boundaries there. Unusual or unexpected circumstances are often the only way to help us move beyond that which is normal or that which, which we are comfortable with. Now, Calvary... And the empty tomb changed everything. We just came through that season of, uh, of, of spending time looking at what happened on the cross of Calvary. And what the statement that Jesus made when the tomb was empty, when he came forward to bring back life. I, I like to tell everybody, he, did, he didn't just move the rock. He kicked that rock out the door and all of our expectations went with it. Now today we're going to look at a family a family that Jesus knew, a family that the Bible says Jesus loved. He spent much time with them. We don't know anything about this family except three people, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And Lazarus had become sick. We don't know how long he had been sick, but, but uh, this sickness that he had began to grow worse. Y'all know what it's like when you get sick? And it just kind of eases into something else. And, and your, your, your things start going through your mind, but then it moves into something else. And it begins to get gradually worse. And there's always a point where we move from sickness to urgency. Parents, y'all know what that's like when it was your kids? Spouses, you know what that's like when it was your other spouse? When, that, when the person that you love got to that place and, and, and no matter what you tried to do, and we all do, and how you tried to intervene, nothing seemed to help. And it seemed to, to run toward urgency. That's what was happening at this home. Lazarus, something happened to him. The sickness came upon him. It began to get worse, and it began to get worse. Now they've moved into urgency, and the belief system that they have within them said, we need Jesus. So they sent out a scouting party. They had seen what Jesus had done before. And Jesus, it says in chapter 10, in verse 40, he had moved out across the Jordan 
to the place where John the Baptist was baptizing. So he's, he's not close by. They lived in Bethany, which was about two miles from Jerusalem. So, so they're, 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 there's proximity is not good. But they sent out the scouting party, and they said, go find Jesus. Lazarus is sick. This is urgent, right? Don't, don't get distracted. Don't delay. Go find Jesus. And read with me in verse number 3. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Go tell him. When you find Jesus, say to him, Lord, you didn't know this, but, but the one that you love, you know the one that you care about now, Surely they knew that God cared about everybody. But there was a closeness or a bond from time. We don't know all the backstory of when they met. We don't know all the things that they had gone through together. But we definitely know that there was a closeness between Jesus and these three siblings. Lord, the one that you love is sick. But hear Jesus' reply. He says in verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death. Now, the ones that are telling the story, they, they, they came and the one that they left behind, uh, they, he, he was urgent. But Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death. Then something they probably didn't fully understand, though they remembered, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Basically, what they didn't know, but what we realize today, he was saying to them, this is not ultimate death, but there's something that is going to be happening in Lazarus' life, and God's going to use Lazarus to bring glory to the Son of God, who they knew and believed Jesus was that Son of God. So these people, they just said, okay. And they turn to go home. Look what it says in verse 5. But Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. They sent these people to go get Jesus, bring him back so that he can heal Lazarus. But Jesus didn't seem to be in a hurry, and Jesus just delayed. He went on doing what he was doing. Maybe he was ministering to people there. Maybe he was healing people there. Maybe he was teaching people there. So the story gets back as these messengers who went to find Jesus, they come back. Now, most likely, listen to me now, most likely this is how it occurred. When the messengers got back, they probably said, where's Jesus? Well, Jesus said that this was not unto death. Most likely, that is the time that Lazarus died. Could you imagine those sisters they're sending someone out, and they're ministering to him. They're doing everything that they know to do. Probably got the cold wash rags and put on him to try to break the fever, trying to get him to, to eat something, but he probably doesn't want to eat. Nobody really wants to eat when they don't feel good, right? And they're ministering to them, probably not getting much sleep, probably doing everything that they can, hoping that Jesus could come back. But when the messengers come back, where's Jesus? He's not here. He said this wasn't unto death just so that he could get glory. He just kept doing what he was doing. And how their heart must have sunk when the one that they loved died. In that day, you would bury someone quickly. This is not where you send them to the undertaker and they prepare the body there and 
They'll have a viewing, you know, when people can come by. I mean, they didn't do embalming and anything like that. This was a, a get it done and get it done quick type of thing. So in the midst of their heart being broken, in the midst of grief and sorrow, like everyone else in that day, they had to go through the hardship of getting him, wrapping him in the burial cloths, taking him to that place, laying him there, having someone roll the stone among it, and standing there and with a heart that's broken with questions. He was young. Why did this happen? And the very hard thing, listen to me now, when they had to turn and walk away and go back home. Now, if that was me or if that was you, we'd have had questions too. And maybe Satan would have come and whispered in their ear, if only Jesus had come. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about you. Where's he at? You've seen him heal other people. He gave sight to the blind. He gave the ability to walk to the lame. He, he cleansed lepers. He was no, uh, he didn't really care who it was. Whomever they brought, Jesus always loved. Jesus always cared. Jesus always healed. I thought he loved you. Maybe he didn't love me. Maybe he didn't care. This was not their expectation. It would seem to them that Jesus, in the midst of their loss and their shock, where they thought it was waste, come on, and hurt, they probably thought to themselves, if only, if only. Our expectations lead us to think others should do what we believe or what we know is right. I'm going to say that again. Y'all listening? Every one of us in this room have expectations. Every one of us have a way that we think things should be. And when we look at things with our expectations, we expect other people to do what we believe is right, or in the fact, we would say, in our emotions, we would say, we know this is right. And if someone else doesn't follow our expectations, immediately we turn and say, they're wrong. Why don't they change? Why won't they do what we know is the right thing to do? Follow the narrative. Look in verse number 17. Now, in the verses leading up to this, he's trying to tell his disciples, it's time for us to go. We need to go to Bethany. And he's trying to describe to them, he's, he said, Lazarus sleeps. And they said, well, that's a good thing. If he's sleeping, he'll get better. And he said, no, no, no. Lazarus, he said in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. He, he may... He may uh, seem like he doesn't know what's going on, but Jesus always knows what's going on. You may not think he understands or cares about your situation and your circumstances more than you know. More than you know. Look in verse number 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had heard had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. This was the custom. If someone has passed away, the people would come, and they would be there in the home with them, and they would mourn with them. As a matter of fact, if you loved, mourning was expe expected. I mean, that's what you would do is you would go, and if they cried, you would cry. Didn't the Bible say that? If they rejoice, you rejoice. That was the way it came in life. So the, the Jewish people, we don't know all the things about Lazarus and Mary and Martha, but they were well thought of. They traveled the two miles. They're there in the house with them, and they're weeping and mourning with them. Verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. I believe she was probably walking pretty quick, don't you? But Mary 
was sitting in the house. You know, for years, I just assumed Mary didn't hear. Martha heard and went, and that might be the case. But have you ever wondered if Mary heard but just sat there anyway? Jesus is coming. Maybe she was saying, we well, should have come earlier. A little late now. You reckon she might have been just a little miffed? Let's hear her words and hear Martha's words. Verse number 21. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, Master, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What was Mary, uh, Martha's expectations? Lord, if you had been here, I know my brother would not be in that tomb over there. Her expectations was Jesus. Can you hear the tone of this? This is your fault. Why didn't you come? When they came back and told us that you weren't coming, you said it's not in the death. How did you know? It was in the death, Jesus. He's, he would not have died if you had just come. Can you hear the tone? As they point the finger of doubt? Satan always wants us to point the finger of doubt. Remember what I said a moment ago? Our expectations is that we are right, and if we could just get everybody else to agree with us of what we know is right, then things will be good. But, but here, she's making her case very plain to Jesus. But listen to this statement of faith, she says in verse 22. But even now, it's almost like she said, Jesus, you blew it. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. All right, y'all look up here. I want everybody looking up here. There will be times in our life when we need to know that when we come before a holy God, we have his ear, we have his heart, and his word tells us that whatever we ask, by the way, that's not my qualifier, that's his qualifier. Whatever we ask, he will do. Now, you just need to pause right now and think, is that the trust and faith and belief that you have in God? That's biblical faith. That's what God wants us to have. He put it out there. Martha had heard it. And deep within her, there was a seed of faith that was there. And she is saying, even now, whatever you ask, I know that God loves you and God will do. Jesus replied to her in verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. <laughs> I think sometimes when we hear preachers preach, we say, amen. So what? Right? Amen. I know. Yes, preacher, I know what the Word of God says, but you don't understand my circumstance. Yes, I know that one day we're going to be there. When the roll is caught up yonder, all of us believers will be there. Verse 24, listen to what Martha says. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. By the way, that's Job chapter 19, verses 25 through verse 27. You can read that on your own time. But I'm here to tell you, she knew the Word of God. She, kn she knew what the Word of God said, and she says, yes, Lord, I know in the end it's all going to be good. But that doesn't help the grief in my heart now. And here's the money statement. You ready for it? Verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. This is the fifth of Jesus' seven I am statements. All right, church. Some of y'all remember when Moses walked in front of the burning bush and it was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. 
And Moses said, I got to know who you are. I got to be able to tell these people who sent me. And he said, I am. That is the existent one. Really, the eternal one. The only word that can only be defined by God. Eternity. Always present, present now, always will be present. Always powerful, powerful now, always will be powerful. Always sovereign, sovereign now in your circumstance, and there will never be anything that will take away the sovereignty of God. King of kings, always has been, always will be. Lord who cares, Savior to come. I am is what he's saying. The I am has stepped into the circumstance, and what you don't know is that I am the resurrection and the life. Here's something you really need to know. The resurrection, the life. That is a definite article. That means the and only the one. There is no resurrection except in Christ. There is no life except in Christ. He's not one of many resurrections. That's what the religions of the world would tell you. That's bull. That doesn't work. He is not one of many ways of life. He is the life. And to know the life, that means that you can have life even through death. Every one of us, if we live, and we are, will die if Christ tarries his coming. It is appointed to man once to die. We all go there. I know somebody's going to throw up Enoch. Somebody's going to throw up Elijah. All right, I'll give you those two. Those are biblical examples of somebody who didn't taste death. Don't bank on that happening for you. Right? What you need to know is that when you face death, somebody who's more powerful than death is there. Death says there must be resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. She's grieving. She's hurt. She's got loss in her life. The one she loved is dead. He says, don't worry about it. Resurrection's here. Resurrection is not an event. Resurrection is a person. If you're looking for an event, you might miss it. But if you find the person, you found it. By the way, there's a lot of death that happens in life before we breathe our last breath. There's a lot of loss that happens in life. There's a lot of times we're in circumstances and we don't know another way. There's a lot of times we find the dead end road. There's a lot of times that there's a hurt that goes beyond all understanding, that nobody knows the pain. What are you going to do? You're going to make it better? What happens when you can't make it better? Church, what happens when you find your dead end and there's nobody there to help you? You need a person that will meet you there. Jesus says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. You're looking for something. Here I am. You're looking for hope. I'm here. You're looking for something that can take the impossible and make it possible. You're looking for the other side of death. That's me. That's me. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, I mean, there's going to be some things in life that we can't overcome. Though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. By the way, when she made that statement of faith, she turned around and left because there really wasn't anything else to say. She made a decision in her heart, in her life, and it's now time for her to walk it out. So verse 28, when she had said these things, she went her way secretly, called Mary, her sister, saying, hey, come here, Mary, Mary, the teacher has come and is calling for you. 
Now, if she was back in the house, maybe she didn't hear, but maybe she heard and didn't care. But now she understands Jesus is asking for her. So what does she do? She gets up, verse 29. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. He's not looking for the big crowd. He's staying back from the city so that he can have a little quiet one-on-one time with her. There needs to be a sermon for her before there's a sermon for everybody else. The sermon for everybody else is coming. But the first thing that she needs to know is, I do love you, I do care, and I have a personal word for you. Y'all listen to me, church. God has a personal word for you. Find your prayer closet, get on your knees, cry out in your heart. He cares, he listens, he speaks. I've always said it this way. I don't know of a way to say it better. If I did, I I, I would share it. But he comes to put his arms of love around you and let you know he cares. And he's done it to me oh so many times and there's nothing that feels as good than the presence of the peace and the power and the anointing of the love and the care of God. Y'all know what I'm talking about? In the midst of the storm, at the height of the hurt, when your mind is swirling, when you cannot see clear, it's good to know that there's someone that will meet you there. Someone that cares. Verse 30, now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And she and the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw Mary rose up quickly, they went out and followed her, saying, she's going to the tomb to weep there. Then Mary came where Jesus was and saw him. <laughs> and she fell down at his feet. She's not coming with a pointed finger. She's coming with a broken heart. But listen to her words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Where were you, Lord? She's still living under her expectations. Her mind is closed to anything else. But it's not time for a sermon. No. Verse 33, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? Church, listen to me. <laughs> there, is, there is dynamite in that verse. When you hurt, he hurts. You may feel it all alone. You may feel like nobody cares. Jesus doesn't come to put you down. <laughs> he meets you there in the depths of your pain and ministers to you there. By the way, where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. The shortest verse in the word of God that speaks so profoundly, Jesus wept there. This drove him to tears. I believe it's the same tears that he shed in the Gethsemane. The pain of death separation of death somebody needs to do something then the jews said see how he loved him some of them said could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying the answer to that is yes he could but like he told his disciples this is so that the glory of god can be seen verse 38 Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, hey, guys, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, 
By this time, there is a stench, for he has been there four days. Lord, you don't understand. We don't want to go through that. I don't know. I understand you may want to see him, but Lord, he's dead. He's dying. He's, he's decaying. The effects of death have already overcome him. It's too late. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? I think at that point, Martha, I call her meatloaf Martha. Martha was a kind of a, a, a let's get it done kind of a girl. I think when she spoke, everybody else listened. Y'all know Martha? By the way, my mama's name was Martha, and that's kind of the way she was too. When mama said it, you better go do it. She don't, you don't want dad to get involved. Mar, Mom was bad enough. I think when she said, you heard what the Lord said. Move the stone. <laughs> I know he's in there. I know he's dead. I know it's going to be a stench. But Jesus said, move the stone. So y'all move the stone. And they're probably going in their head. Okay. Let's go. Come on, guys. And they move the stone out of the way. Hmm. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, <laughs> Lord, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. We need to say that sometimes in our own prayers. Lord, I'm, I'm grateful that you heard me. You always, Lord, hear me. There's never a time that you don't hear me. But because of these people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Lord, everybody needs to know that this is you that's doing this. Now, when he had said these things, he cried out with a, say it. I mean, there's a crowd around. There's some people that came from Jerusalem. There's all these others that are there. And they're, they're all, what's going through their mind when they roll away the stone? Oh, this is not going to be good. But he put forth that preacher voice so that all would hear him. And he said these words, Lazarus, he's speaking to the dead, personally by name. Lazarus, I'm talking to you, come forth. And when God speaks, we say yes. Or should I say we say yes, sir. Oh, Lazarus, who was dead, covered in all those cloths, those eyes popped open. His ears are hearing. His heart's now beating. <laughs> and he, get, he did the, the mummy walk. And I wonder what it was like when he spoke those words. Do you think it got quiet? And all of a sudden, they heard a rattle, and they did a look, and here he comes. <laughs> I don't know what it was like, but you know it was something. When the light hit him, and he's coming out, and the one who had been dead four days is now alive. You think there was a squawk? You think there was a squeal? You think there was a few people who hit their knees? Do you think there was some people who raised their hands? It's about to get better. And he who died came out bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with the cloths. And Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. I think there's two statements in here that I pray that you will memorize that will become part of the fiber of your being and that you will carry with you the remainder of your days while you're on this earth. The first one is this Jesus said, I am the resurrection, and the life. I pray that you never forget that. I pray that you know that there is a God who is bigger. I pray that you know there is a God who can, that no matter what your circumstances are, he's the God of the second chance. But the other phrase I never want you to forget is when Christ said, loose him and let him go. He doesn't belong in grave cloths. Get it off of him. Somebody went, ran up to him, and they started taking those things off of his face, and they got to see that face smiling. <laughs> 
I mean, the Bible says absent from the body, present with the Lord. He had been in sickness. He had been in pain. He had been at the place where he was grasping and and hoping for life, but life fled him and laid him down. But now Jesus said, I'm not through with you. Lazarus, come forth. And he came out. They took that off of him. What a smile. Maybe he said, hey, good to see you. Oh, you won't believe what I've been through. Praise God from whom all blessings are flow they were unwrapped him i mean that there's got to be a stir in there like a hornet's nest was turned loose among them there is something that's happened there's the excitement that is there loose him and let him go you know there's some things in life that we need a second chance for There's some people that are facing some things and they need God to say, loose him from those things and let him go. I was thinking about this early this morning. And I was thinking about those that I've seen bound with addiction that God said, loose him and let him go. I've seen some people in my time that have been hurt. Their spirit has been broken, but Jesus met them there and said, loose him and let him go. There's been some people who have found that they have been bound by finances, that they have been bound in a bad marriage. There has been broken, brokenness in families. There has been no worth in someone whatsoever. They feel like that they are no good to anybody. And God says, you're a child of the king. Those old things, they got to go. Loose him, God, and let him go. This is what I call living resurrection. This is someone who had faced the end and was alive again. And by the way, if you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, that's the testimony of you. You are no longer held by death. You are no longer held by the empty circumstances of this life. He wants to say to you, loose him from all these things and turn them loose and let them go. To New Holland, you know what he needs to say to us? Lord, loose them. Let them go. That's what he said at Pentecost. Send the Holy Spirit to them, Lord. Loose them. Turn them free. Let them go in the world. And 120 people change the world. And you and I are affected by it. We pray for revival. We pray for another anointing of God. All we need is what we already have. But he needs to set us free to walk in newness of life. Living resurrection. Quit living like you're dead. Quit living like those circumstances are bigger than you. Listen to me. Get beyond your expectations. Because on the other side of your expectations, you'll find the living Lord. It won't be long. And Jesus will be walking that last week, Passion Week on earth. In chapter 12, verse number 9, it says this. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but they they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. You know what they said? We'll kill him again. (laughs) You think that bothered Lazarus a half a second? I mean, once somebody has already faced death, you think that's going to scare them again? Once you've already faced the end and you found that Jesus was bigger, there should be nothing that strikes fear in you again. Did y'all hear me? Once you've found the risen Lord and you're walking in resurrection, there should be nothing, there should be nothing that keeps you from walking in boldness of life. Yeah, they would, they would crucify Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And yes, he would say to the God the Father, unto thy heads I commend my spirit. He would give his life a ransom for me. 
And they took him and they bound him in those <laughs> grave cloths. And they put him in that borrowed tomb. But on Resurrection Sunday mornings, those angels kicked that rock away. And I don't know who and I don't know how because I wasn't in that grave, but they took those grave clothes off of him. They wrapped him up and they laid him down because Jesus was not going to be in that grave anymore. I wonder what it was like when Jesus saw Lazarus or Lazarus saw Jesus. <laughs> Lord, I've been there. These other folks, they were, they were scared, they were done, but I know who you are. There's a testimony Lazarus had. Yes, 40 days later, Jesus lifted his hands and ascended to glory. Amen? And we don't know when, but there was a day that Lazarus breathed his last breath. They once again wrapped him in those grave cloths and put him in a tomb. But you know what happened? He closed his eyes to this world. He raised his eyes into the glory of the Lord. What a reunion that was when Lazarus said, You called me once. <laughs> Thank you for not forgetting me. Thank you for calling me again. And Jesus said, Welcome home. I wonder what it would be like. Give me just a few seconds and I'm done. I wonder what it would be like if we lived our life like Lazarus lived his. No fear of circumstances. No dead ends as long as Jesus is around. What can the world do to you? What can Satan do to you? You're an overcomer. I mean, all they can do is kill you. But when that doesn't work, what are they going to do? To live a life under the glory of God. Jesus said this would happen so that the Son of God could receive glory. That's my prayer for me and you, is that God would take our life and we would be defined as bringing him honor and glory, and praise. I don't know what your death sentence is in this world. I don't know what your circumstance is. But I can tell you who the answer is. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, what are you going to do with death? Because he is the only resurrection. He's the author of life. He's the sustainer of life. He's the giver of life. And he's the taker of life. It all depends on you.